On the 17th of April 1320, after 20 years of campaigning at the Papal Curia, Hereford's most renowned bishop, Thomas de Cantaloupe, was canonised by Pope John XXII in a service at the church of Notre Dame des Dormes in Avignon. The events leading to that service tell us far more than the story of just one man. They involve a diverse cast of characters, each with their own story to tell. But how can we begin to understand this story? What is its significance? This small documentary aims to build a picture of the life, death and miracles of this little-known Herefordian saint in order to show how such stories are integral to our understanding of the Middle Ages and how, when properly analysed, they can offer us a view into the lives of the medieval people that we might not otherwise get. Hereford Cathedral itself has had a long, illustrious, if sometimes troubled history. It was founded on this site in 676 AD by Bishop Putter, who settled here when he was driven from Rochester by Ethelred of Mercia. The cathedral church stood for nearly 400 years before it was burnt to the ground in 1055 by the Welsh under Griffith ap Llewellyn and Eothgar of Mercia. The Brute Tuasogion reads, Griffith closely pursued them into the fortress, and he entered therein and pillaged the fortress and destroyed it and burnt the town. The cathedral was eventually refounded in 1079, and much of the Norman work stands to this day. Therefore, Cantaloupe came along early into the history of Hereford Cathedral. The most commonly accepted year of Cantaloupe's birth is 1218. However, recent research has suggested that 1222 may be more accurate. And according to his successor, Richard de Swinfield, it was well known throughout the kingdom that Cantaloupe came from the noble stock of the barons of England. The Cantaloupes had first arrived in England in 1066 and were soon granted territories in Somerset. Over the following decades, the Cantaloupe family maintained the king's favour and were granted further territories on both sides of the channel. Thomas was the third son of William, the second Baron Cantaloupe, and Millicent de Gournay. Both William and his father, William the Elder, had served as stewards to the royal household during the reign of King John, and were said by Roger of Wendover in 1212 to be among the king's most evil counsellors, standing by their master during the time of his interdict and excommunication. Young Thomas was taken under the wing of his uncle Walter de Cantaloupe, the Bishop of Worcester. At first it is said that Thomas wished to become a knight. Thou shalt be a soldier, his uncle is said to have told him, a soldier to serve the highest of kings and fight under the colours of the glorious martyr St. Thomas. Little more is known of this period in Cantaloupe's life, but supposedly the child thought no more of these glorious fancies, and so Thomas seemed destined for the church. Walter sent his nephew to the schools and beneficed him, training his young nephew to become a churchman. In around 1237, Thomas was sent to Paris with his elder brother Hugh to study a Master of Arts on the constituent elements of grammar, logic, rhetoric, arithmetic, geometry, astronomy and music. He received his Master's in 1245 as well as a degree in canon law. Soon after this, in 1245, the first Council of Lyon was called by Pope Innocent IV to rally the church against Emperor Frederick II, who was besieging Rome. It is unsurprising that both the Cantaloupe brothers answered the Pope's call and attended the meeting, at which Thomas was appointed a papal chaplain and given a special dispensation to hold benefices in plurality, which he used to great effect. Eventually, Cantaloupe returned to academia, becoming a Doctor of Roman Law at Orléans University. After continuing his studies, he was appointed as a Doctor of Canon Law at Oxford University in 1255. His twin doctorates in Roman and Canon Law gave Cantaloupe an understanding essential for senior churchmen in the 13th century. As the two legal systems were complementary, the law of the church was organised according to the same principles and was hardly comprehensible without the preliminary study of the Code and Digest. Cantaloupe was appointed Chancellor of Oxford University in 1261 and used the position to make many highly powerful friends, most notably King Henry III, who is recorded to have given gifts to him. 
However, his tenure as Chancellor was cut short in 1263, when Cantaloupe was selected by the Earl of Leicester, Simon de Montfort, to travel to Armin in January 1264 to procure King Louis IX's adjudication upon the reforming baron's provisions of Oxford. After Prince Edward defeated Simon de Montfort at the Battle of Evesham in 1265, Cantaloupe returned to Paris to read theology and became a doctor of the subject, which we may be sure was intended from the beginning to be the crown of Cantaloupe's academic career. Cantaloupe returned to Oxford University as a doctor in theology in 1273, and at a Vespers presided over by the Archbishop of Canterbury, he was appointed Chancellor of Oxford for the second time in 1274. Cantaloupe was soon called away from Oxford for the second Council of Lyon, called by Pope Gregory X in late 1274, reprising his role as papal chaplain after an absence of almost 30 years. After the council, Cantaloupe returned not to education, but to the multiple benefices he held in England, ensuring that the reforms and policies outlined at the council were adhered to. This occupied him until May 1275, when the Bishop of Hereford, John Le Breton, died and Cantaloupe was elected as his successor to the see. It is worth noting that between 1263 and 1265, Cantaloupe had a significant but brief political career. Politics allowed Cantaloupe to build further on the skills he had developed in his many years of education, honing and perfecting them for his later service as Bishop of Hereford. When he returned in 1263, he was dragged immediately into the dispute between Simon de Montfort and Henry III, in a country which was on the brink of civil war. The young Cantaloupe was sent to France as part of a small group to plead the case of the provisions of Oxford to King Louis IX and to gain his arbitration on the matter. Despite their efforts, Louis quashed the plea and condemned the provisions. There was now no choice in the matter and England descended into civil war. Simon took up arms and clashed with Henry at the Battle of Lewis in 1264. The victorious Montfort took control of the royal seal and held both King Henry and Prince Edward prisoner at his capital, Hereford. Simon de Montfort's victory endowed him with the keys of authority. He began to take control of the government, and three electors were selected to create a council of nine who would help the king rule the country. Thomas de Cantaloupe was elected as Chancellor of England and Keeper of the Privy Seal in February 1265, and he was apparently conscientious, immune to bribery, and responsive to the Council's directions, precisely what the Montfortian regime needed. Under the provisions of Oxford, the Chancellor was to hold, the pos hold his position for a year, but Cantaloupe did not serve a full term. Instead, in May 1262, he relinquished the role, along with the King's seal, answering for his deeds as Chancellor to the Council of Nine, as was expected. He could not have known what was to come later that year. Prince Edward was to escape from Hereford Castle, and on the 4th of August 1265, would engage Simon de Montfort and his supporters at the Battle of Evesham. The Royalists finally struck the decisive blow, and Simon lay dead on the field of battle, and the reforming party was crippled by its losses. With the reformists' dreams as dead as their leader, Cantaloupe retired to Paris to study theology. This, however, was not the end of Cantaloupe's role in English politics. His friendship with King Henry and Prince Edward was eventually rekindled. 22nd of August 1265, Henry formally granted Cantaloupe safe conduct in England. On the 10th of February 1266, he further granted remission to Master Thomas de Cantaloupo, sometime Chancellor, of all the king's rancor and indignation of mind, conceived against him by occasion of the disturbance that had occurred in the realm, and admission of him to the king's grace. By 1267, Cantaloupe was recorded as the king's special clerk, which is attributed as his bond of piety, which he held in common with Henry. Cantaloupe finally returned to England in 1273 to teach at Oxford, and was appointed as chancellor for the second time in 1274 and Edward I had noticed Cantaloupe's skill and ability as Chancellor, and duly reappointed him as a member of his council. His last major role in English politics was to act as a regent for the king whilst he was away in France in 1279. Cantaloupe was elected bishop to the See of Hereford in 1275, and royal assent was granted on the 26th of June the same year. 
According to Richard Strange, he was set up as a light in the candlestick of the Church of Hereford to shine to all in learning and virtue. Little else is known about Thomas de Cantaloupe's character, apart from what we can gain from the bishop's registers. His itinerary reveals that he spent much of his time travelling around his residencies in the sea, carrying out episcopal duties such as ordaining priests, preaching to his benefices, and consecrating altars, churches, and churchyards. From his itinerary, we can also infer that his residences at Bosbury and Stretton Suggis were his favourites. Even the hazards of travel in the winter months do not seem to have curtailed his preambulations. He even travelled around the country during these months to attend the king's court, a church council, and his other benefices. Cantaloupe, therefore, was often absent from the diocese, and as a result became an astute fellow in selecting other bishops to carry out his duties in his stead. He didn't only appoint fellow bishops to help with his duties, however, whilst absent. He would appoint vicar generals with the power to procure the assistance of other bishops whilst he was absent from the see. It was in 1276 that Cantaloupe instructed Seneschal John de Bradenham to display an open heart and a vigilant mind towards his duties. It was these two assets that Cantaloupe had used himself in the appointment of the stewards, vicars general and fellow bishops to oversee his lands and duties in his absence. The rest of the bishop's register is concerned with the multiplicity of disputes on which Cantaloupe engaged himself with all the skill learned in his legal training and all the spirit belonging to the aristocratic caste from which he sprung. The best example of this is in the legal suit between Cantaloupe and Gilbert de Clare, the Earl of Gloucester, who had encroached upon the bishop's chase of Eastner and Colwall using his foresters. He took control of the area from Cantaloupe's more casual predecessor, John Le Breton, who has made no protest at this encroachment on episcopal rights. The chase was an important part of the episcopal demesne, from, from it the bishops drew a greater part of their game, and Cantaloupe proved his mettle in this dispute. He knew exactly what his rights as bishop included, and he proved just what a fearsome opponent he could be. It is recorded that his servants had much to say about the dispute, when the earl had appeared in force with armed retainers, bidding the bishop know that no sorry shaveling should take from him what he and his ancestors had long enjoyed in peace. The earl then procured a royal writ to postpone the proceedings, and the bishop retired to a wood, where he donned his full bishop's robes. With clergy at his side, he marched back into the courtroom, and he issued forth, hurling anathemas and pronounced a sentence of excommunication against all that hindered and molested his and the Church of Hereford's rights. After a two-year and three-month-long campaign, a jury finally gave their verdict in the churchman's favour, with a ditch dug along the boundary line, which still exists to this day. A couple of years later, the Earl's foresters, who had been insolent and menacing before, had been overawed by the bishop's actions, and some of them appeared as penitents before the bishop and sued for formal absolution. Shortly after Cantaloupe's previous disputes, he became embroiled in a serious quarrel with John Peckham, the Archbishop of Canterbury. Cantaloupe's clash with Peckham began with the small dispute in 1279 over the actions of Cantaloupe's subdean Robert of Gloucester in a matrimonial suit. Robert had ignored a warning from the Archbishop and was duly fined. Yet mandates continued to be issued, followed by a warning to Cantaloupe that he would be under pain of suspension of his chapel and an interdict if proceedings against the subdean were not taken. Cantaloupe therefore left England in 1280, appointing Robert as official of Hereford, and as Becket had sought the cloistered Karma Pontigny to escape from his embittered relations with King Henry II, so Cantaloupe retired to Normandy when the dispute with the official of Canterbury was at its height. Peckham writes that during this time, we have learnt that he is hiding in the parts beyond the sea, and is attempting through his proctors at the Curia to seek apostolic letters against us, concerning certain undue exactions and other injuries. Bishop Thomas returned to England in 1281, perhaps thinking that the situation had been resolved. However, it had not. In his absence, Peckham had tried to push his jurisdictional powers over Hereford, but Robert had repeatedly refused to accept the Archbishop's authority. Cantaloupe was drawn back into the debate. Peckham offered a deal. If Cantaloupe acquiesced to his demands and excommunicated Robert, he would take no action against Cantaloupe directly. He declined, 
making it clear that he felt the matter was a question of principle, not personal dignity. On the 15th of January, 1282, Cantaloupe appealed to Peckham and repeated it to the Archbishop's Court on the 17th of January. On the 5th of February, 1282, at a meeting to discuss the freeing of Aumarie de Montfort, the debate came to a head. Peckham again ordered Cantaloupe to excommunicate Robert, and Cantaloupe again refused. After the argument became heated on the 7th of February, Peckham retired to his chambers. A few of his councillors who had accompanied him advised him to excommunicate Cantaloupe. Robert de Lacy read the warning from Peckham, that if you do not obey our warnings, henceforth we excommunicate you in these writings. According to John Lewis, an eyewitness who gave evidence in 1307, Peckham wept as he ordered it to be read. Thomas, who was so tenacious in his continued opposition on this matter, that the Archbishop described his actions as no less than from the inane brain injury from the perversity of the will, and decided that because of his great faults, he deserved to be bound by the sentence of greater excommunication. Peckham ordered the Bishop of London to excommunicate Cantaloupe in his name on the 17th of February, 1282, and again on the 15th of March, 1282. Thomas, now excommunicate, set off on the seven-week journey to Rome to appeal his sentence directly to Pope Martin IV. Peckham had heard rumours of Cantaloupe's plan, and on the 31st of March wrote to his curial proctors to warn them about his adversary, and ask that they be vigilant and careful, for Cantaloupe came walking in all falsehood. He warned them that Cantaloupe was wolf-like, well-versed in all cunning and trickery, and more under the appearance of a dove, the same bishop, particular to his own devices, devised malice against us. There was something almost childish in the way they hurled their thunderbolts. Cantaloupe arrived at Orvito in June 1282 to find Peckham's proctors busy petitioning that, as he was an excommunicate, he should not be received by the Pope. Two cardinals were called to make an inquiry, yet could find no reason to exclude Cantaloupe from the communion. However, in August, Cantaloupe became seriously ill, his crazy body worn out with former labours, destitute of vitals for reinforcement. As his illness worsened, Pope Martin sanctioned Cantaloupe's absolution, and it was on the evening of Tuesday the 25th of August, 1282, that he finally returned to the bosom of the church to which he had given his life's work. Thomas de Cantaloupe, Bishop of Hereford, commended his spirit to God and ascended into heaven. When Cantaloupe died, they removed his heart, and they boiled his bones in either red wine or vinegar, following a process called Moss Teutonics. They then journeyed back towards England, yet Peckham was unwilling to allow the bones of his old adversary to enter the country. He ignored a letter from the Roman penitentiary, which absolved Cantaloupe with sanction from Pope Martin, and maintained that his contumacious cleric was still excommunicate. He also warned the canons of Hereford Cathedral that any attempt to bury Cantaloupe's bones there would result in an interdict. Despite these threats, the retinue that had accompanied Cantaloupe to Rome covertly brought his bones back into England without giving Peckham a chance to react. They deliberately processed the bones through Canterbury, and apparently the bones bled in their casket, and it was seen by all as a miracle. On the 20th of January, 1283, Edmund, the Earl of Cornwall, raised the matter of Cantaloupe's resting place with Peckham at a council in Northampton. The Archbishop was finally persuaded to rescind his decision, and the two caskets containing Cantaloupe's bones were placed on the altar in the nearby church of St. Andrew and received his absolution. Cantaloupe's relics were finally allowed to proceed to their rightful resting places. He had bequeathed his heart to Edmund, who enshrined it at the monastery of the Order of Bahoms in Ashridge, and his bones were buried in the Lady Chapel in Hereford Cathedral. In 1286, Bishop Swinfield ordered his officers to inquire, to make an inquiry if God worked miracles at the tomb of the burial of the said Thomas with St. Severus at San Severo. He specified that inquiry should be made by the dean and by other discreet men as to what sentence the Lord Pope had passed concerning the above-named bishop and of the miracles that were done concerning him and all these things were written down, an inquiry was made as to if it might be expedient to seek canonization, and in what way and how. Four years after his original burial, on the 3rd of April, 1287, Cantaloupe's posthumous career of saintly miracles began. 
His relics have been translated to a new tomb in the north transept of Hereford Cathedral, and soon afterwards people began claiming to have received cures from them. The translation of the relics was not an uncommon event in the Middle Ages. It was an ancient and traditional method of marking sanctity of the individual concerned, often marking that person as a saint. Certainly, this grand ceremony held by Swinfield at the high point of the Christian year suggested that the bones being elevated were those of a saint. The sudden profusion of miraculous cures prompted the Worcestershire analyst to claim that God first showed the holiness of Thomas de Canterloop, Bishop of Hereford, by means of miracles manifest. His first posthumous miracle was performed on the 28th of March, 1287, which was a cure of Edith Oldchrist, the wife of the local ironmonger of being insane. Robert Oldchrist brought his wife to Hereford Cathedral seeking a cure, and a week later, on the Thursday before Palm Sunday, she had a vision of cantaloupe and was healed. News of this event was met with elation and was celebrated with a bell ringing and a te deum. The miracles continued to occur every few days at the shrine, and by 1290, the pilgrim cult of Thomas de Cantaloupe had grown so large that offers to the shrine were bringing in several, several hundred pounds per year. The income was so great that there was even a dispute between the dean and the treasurer over the ownership of the wax tapers left at the shrine as votive offerings. Miracles at the shrine, like the tapers, were beginning to accumulate, so much so that by the close of the 13th century, more than 250 miracles had been attributed to Cantaloupe. News of the miracles spread all over the country, and ever more pilgrims came seeking cures. It was said that the blind had their sight restored, the lame could walk, the deaf could hear, the mute could speak, the insane were returned to sanity, and the dead brought back to life, all through the power of these holy relics. The cult continued to grow, and so on the 19th of April, 1290, Swinfield wrote to the Pope to propose Cantaloupe for canonization, listing the many miracles that had been brought at his shrine and elsewhere, and describing Cantaloupe as he who was a burning and shining light, attested by many miracles in the candlestick of the church. Even Peckham's retainers believed in the miraculous powers of Cantaloupe, and in October 1292, whilst Peckham was severely ill, sent a, sent a candle to the shrine praying for the miracle. Unfortunately, their prayers were not answered, and two months later the archbishop passed away in this ironic final confrontation between the old combatants. The bishop had finally exacted his posthumous revenge on Peckham, and the two adversaries were reunited in eternity. After 16 years of campaigning, Pope Clement V issued a papal bull on the 23rd of August 1305, declaring that happy rumours had reached him about the miracles and sanctity of Thomas de Cantaloupe, explaining that, as we have already heard, the blind have recovered their sight there, the lame and the dead rise again. Measures were put into place to start the proceedings of a canonization trial, giving three papal commissioners four months to investigate the claims. We order your discretion by apostolic order that you should make careful inquiry as to the truth concerning the faith, morals, and life of the said Bishop of Hereford, and also about his reputation, the miracles, and other circumstances surrounding these sick people, both through those witnesses whom the said dean and chapter know to have produced concerning these matters, as well as through others. You are to do this within the space of four months and the receipt of these present letters. In 1320, he was finally canonized as a saint of the church. Cantaloupe's canonization leaves us with perhaps the most comprehensive account there is of a medieval canonization process. England's second Thomas attracted many pilgrims, and at its zenith, the income of miracles from the shrine rivaled that of Canterbury itself. The proliferation of miracle stories is Cantaloupe's true legacy, and by analysing them, we can get a deeper, more personal understanding of the day-to-day -day activities and beliefs of the normal people who are so, over, so often overlooked in the study of medieval history.